Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, this SKF uh, Stronger webinar on GBLM. My name is Ellen Lydon, uh, and I'm very happy to welcome you here today. Uh, just a quick couple of points before we uh, uh, before I hand over to Albrecht. Um, this session is being recorded and will be published uh, on YouTube and uh, on the SKF Evolution magazine uh, website. Um, if you have any questions or if you have any technical issues, please use the chat function to uh, to raise them there. Um, and um, yes, w welcome once again. And with that, I will hand over to Albert. Thank you very much, Elin. So good morning, everyone. Good evening. Um, my name is Albrecht Nestle. I'm Knowledge Area Manager for Performance Prediction at SKF. And today I will talk about the generalized bearing life model, GBLM, which we have released in 2019 for hybrid bearings. On the agenda today, I will briefly talk about the motivation and the background, why we developed this life model, then give an overview about current rating life models and how they're being used. Briefly touch the advantages of hybrid bearings, why they are used in certain applications, then explain the GBLM concept, how we validated GBLM and conclude my presentation with some application examples and also a live demo in our calculation software SKF Bearing Select. So the motivation in the background. Um, if you look at the life of rolling bearings, it's characterized by extreme high pressures. So in the contact, you have mag um, magnitude of gigapascal contact pressure. But on the other hand, the bearings should last very, very long. So years, sometimes even decades. But the range of the speeds can be from very low to very high. The temperatures can be very low to very high. You usually have some contamination in the bearing and all this has to be carried by an extremely thin lubrication film, which is a few microns or less thick. And then if you look at fuel statistics of bearings, you will see that around 90% outlive the equipment. So the bearings are scrapped with the machine they were mounted to. And nine and a half percent, they are replaced due to preventive reasons. So people were not sure whether the, the bearing would survive the next phase, so they exchanged it. And only 0.5 percent fail or uh, fail in the field and thus are replaced. And if you look at these 0.5 percent, around a third is due to classical fatigue, classical spall. 16% um, are due to improper handling, so maybe during transportation or during mounting, the bearings are pre-damaged, and around 50% fail due to surface-related failures. Now, maybe you've heard about GBLM already, and uh, the principle or the core of GBLM is the separation of surface from subsurface effects. And you might ask yourself, why is SKF developing uh, a life model for surface effects if it's only 50% of 0.5% of the bearings in the fields that fail due to surface issues. But think of it the other way. The 90% that outlive the equipment, how many of these bearings were maybe over-dimensioned, over-designed? So maybe there is a huge cost-saving potential by using a more realistic rating life model that could allow you to choose a smaller bearing, a smaller shaft diameter, another bearing series, or a simpler, cheaper bearing even, if you could quantify the life more realistically. And also in these nine and a half percent, there are a lot of, a lot of uncertainty obviously, and maybe this uncertainty could be overcome with a more realistic rating life model. So more realistic rating life models are beneficial for all of this uh, cake. Now, I would like to start with a short example. Um, in this case, we have a pump application you have three bearings. On one side, you have angular contact ball bearings in a back-to-back -back arrangement. And on the left side, you have a deep groove ball bearing. And you would like to replace or design, select the right bearing here. Now you have the choice between an all steel bearing or a bearing with ceramic rolling elements, a hybrid bearing, which is quite costly. But you have the choice. And if you look at the application data, the load is nothing extreme. It's a moderate load with a C over P ratio of around 12. The speed, nothing extreme. But if you look at the lubrication and the contamination, 
you will realize that the film thickness is too low, which is indicated by the viscosity ratio kappa. It's 0.3 only. It should be actually much higher than one, but it's 0.3 due to the low viscosity of the high at the high temperature, and also the lubricant is contaminated with water. And also you have particles in your lubricant indicated by an eta C of 0.3. That should be also much higher, ideally, so close to one. And if you would calculate with an ISO life model, for example, the one in the ISO 281, the life of these two bearing variants, the all steel bearing and the hybrid bearing, the all steel bearing would have around 3000 hours, whereas the hybrid bearing only 2400 hours. So that's a difference of 19% penalizing the hybrid bearing. And the reason for that, if you look at the formula, it's practically the same formula. Um, the load ratings are also the same. So that's the C that we have here. But what changes here, or what influences here the hybrid bearing is that in the A iso factor, and I will come later to that one, there is um, a parameter characterizing the bearing, which is called a fatigue load limit, the CU. And there was a new ISO standard released, the 20056 in 2018, which penalizes for all hybrid bearings, the CU by 15 or 27%. So systematically, all hybrid bearings will have a lower A ISO factor than their all steel twin, always. But experience should was that hybrid bearings really outperform all steel bearings in these conditions. So I think I can, can conclude that the ISO life model is not really predicting reality in this case. Now let's have a more general view on um, current rating life models. And you can have, or we have maybe three groups here. The first is ISO life, all the ISO life models in the numerous standards. Then we have the current life models for SKF all steel bearing, which is SKF rating life, and the AFC, the advanced fatigue calculation. And we have the new generalized bearing life model, GBLM. And you see there are a lot of life models used in the market and common in the field. And you can categorize them into two major groups. The first group are the load based models, which use the equivalent load. P, which is radial and axial load in one parameter, and usually the load rating C, which characterizes the bearing performance. So these are load based models. You could also say simpler models, and you usually can even calculate them by hand with tables and graphs. And then we have advanced models, which are the stress based models. So they are based on the actual contact stresses, like the advanced fatigue calculation or the stress based GBLM. It all started with the basic rating life, which is defined in the ISO 281, and this is called the C over P life sometimes as well, which later has been enhanced with A factors. I will come to this later, like the A1, A2, A3, or the A ISO. And the most advanced model is the modified reference rating life in the ISO TS 1621. That is a bit a mixture because it's somehow based on the load rating, but also based on the actual contact stresses. The SKF rating life is what you will find on SKF.com or in our general catalog, and you can also calculate this by hand for steel bearings. The AFC life is implemented in SKF simulation software like SKF SimPro, and is usually used by SKF application engineers and GBLM, um, the generalized bearing life model, the load based one, you can start using it right away after this meeting today in SKF Bearing Select. And the stress-based model is used internally at SKF for customer cases. Now let's look at the timeline and also the evolution of bearing life models. It started all around the 1940s with the development of the basic rating life. And at that time, the steel quality was quite bad. So there was really a dominant failure mode, a classical spall, which is caused by impurities and inclusions in the steel that cause stress concentration and cracks occur. The cracks propagate towards the surface, and then you have major spalls on the raceway. 
And Arvid Palmgren found out that it correlates quite well with the dynamic capacity. So that is the characterizing performance parameter, which is still used in a lot of um, uh, for a lot of life models. And you will find it at in any catalog of any bearing manufacturer. It's defined as the load um, that the bearing can withstand and lasts for one million revolution. So it's it's actually a load. But the steel quality improved. And it was found that other effects also impact the life. For example, the duplication expressed in the kappa, the contamination expressed in the eta C, and the fatigue load limit, which is called PU at SKF, and in the ISO standard, it's the CU. And all these three parameters affect the ASKF or the AISO factor which you will see in the modified rating life or in the SKF rating life. So this is like a mixed together in one parameter. Um, but also this, these models are not sufficient because you can have really demanding application conditions. For example, with complex internal loading conditions due to centrifugal loads. You can have complex clearance or preload conditions. You can have misalignment of the shaft. You can have inner geometry of the bearing like profiles or the osculation in the ball bearing. And all this affects the pressure distribution and requires an advanced model like the advanced fatigue calculation or the modified reference rating life. But um, development continues. And we at SKF, we develop new scientific models, new models for failure modes. And these models can be for surface region or for the subsurface region. And you can imagine that if you would like to implement such a new model in a life model, which is based on 80 or which is 80 years old, it's both mathematically and physically very, very, very difficult and almost impossible to, to add this to such a complex um, maybe house, you could call it. So we said, let's separate surface from subsurface effects in GBLM um, and to continuously build uh, new models into this. Besides the separation of surface and subsurface effects, we also introduced or have an additional output, which is the RSF, the relative surface fatigue. That is an indicator that will help you to understand whether you have a surface or a subsurface issue in that application. And with all that, we can quantify more realistically additional design features of bearings, additional failure modes, and quantify demanding application conditions much more realistically. That's the huge benefit of GBLM. Now let's have a closer look at um, the ISO 281 and the load ratings behind it. So if you look into the ISO standard, you will find this formula for roller bearings to calculate the dynamic load rating or the capacity of a bearing. And you see that it's mostly geometry which defines the load rating. So for example, the length of the rollers, the diameter of the rollers, the number of the rollers, the number of rows, and there is something which is called the material factor. And the material factor um, is actually to be chosen from a predefined table. Um, and uh, that is quite general, I would say. I will come to that on the next slide as well. If you take the load rating and combine it with the external load in the P, in the equivalent load P, you have the basic rating life. And in the modified rating life, you have in addition the A1 factor, which is the factor for reliability. So usually you calculate an L10 life, which means that 10% of your bearing population might fail before the calculated life. But some applications require an LL5 or an L1. So only 1% may fail earlier. And this is adjusted with the A1 factor. And as I said before, the AISO factor is reflecting the lubricant regime via the kappa, the contamination via the eta C, and the material via the CU. And here it says material, but actually the C value or the CU value is also defined as a load defined as the load that leads to 1500 megapascal contact pressure. So you know that if you now go to another steel, 
it actually does not change the contact pressure. If you would change the profile, it would change the contact pressure, but not in other steel because it has the same Young's modulus. So that's not, I would not really say it's a material um, factor here. It's more like a stress, a stress related factor that we are seeing in the CU. So what I would like to conclude from that slide is that the life model, the modified rating life, is strongly influenced by the geometry of bearings, but there are plenty of design features which cannot be expressed only with these few influence factors. There's not a surface finish, there's nothing for the hardness, there's nothing for a coating and so on. All this cannot be expressed in such a model. Um, if you look into the scope part of the ISO, it states the ISO 281 is defined for commonly used, high quality hardened bearing steels. And that is uh, all and nothing. It's a quite general statement. The ISO does not state anything about a minimum requirement for the hardness. It does not state any additional benefit for a high quality steel or does not penalize low quality steels. Commonly hardened bearing steel, that's it. And explicitly, if you search for ceramic rolling elements or hybrid bearings, you will not find anything in that ISO standard. Um, and now if you look a bit at the physics of the bearing, here is a table showing the steel properties and the silicon nitride properties. And if you look at the Young's modulus or the elastic modulus, you will see that hybrid bearings or the rolling elements in hybrid bearings have around 50% higher Young's modulus, so they are stiffer. And if you look at this illustration here, you can of course see that a stiffer rolling element means a smaller contact area. But if the load is the same, then the pressure must be higher. And higher stiffness causes higher contact pressure. And in all stress-based life models, this will result in a shorter rating life. So any load-based and stress-based life model that is on the market right now will have a shorter life for hybrid bearings. That's the current situation. Now let's have a brief look at the advantages of hybrid bearings, why they are used in certain applications. So as I said, they have steel rings and um, silicon nitride rolling elements. And they are characterized by a very good performance and thus a long life in pool lubrication and contamination conditions. Usually they have less friction, they have a lower operating temperature than an all steel bearing, and the lower temperature correlates with a longer grease life. Of course, it's a ceramic rolling element, so they have excellent electrical insulation properties. They have higher stiffness, as shown on the previous slide, which is good for um, applications that require stiffness, like machine tools. And they have a lower density of the material, and this causes less centrifugal forces. So also, this is very good for high speeds. And that's the reason why um, in some challenging applications, like in the railway applications where electrical discharges are characteristic, they have uh, poor lubrication conditions, they have a lot of grease lubricated bearings, and they have um, requirements for very, very long maintenance intervals and thus a very long grease life. So that's a typical application for hybrid bearings, as well as machine tool spindles and so on. They have extremely high speeds, they have high centrifugal forces, they require high stiffness, they can have poor lubrication at these very high speeds. In electrical vehicle applications and in electric motors, you can have electric discharges, you can have high accelerations and also high speeds. And in aero applications, you have extremely high temperatures up to 200 degrees Celsius and extremely high speeds. And in all these applications, hybrid bearings are beneficial and quite common. Now, let's have a look at GBLM concept. And um, this uh, model has been developed in the last eight to nine years, has been developed um, by our scientists in Houten in the Netherlands, by Guillermo Morales, by Antonio Gabelli and Alexander de Vries. 
And you will see down here the major publication, which was from 2015, if you want to know more about the background of GBLM. And um, what they have done, they took as a basis the classical Hertzian rolling contact fatigue model, which is for the subsurface. So what you see here in this illustration is the stress field and the relevant stresses are underneath the surface for the Hertzian rolling contact fatigue model. And what they have done, they enhanced that subsurface model with tribological models for the surface. That's the core of GBLM. So it's not something completely new, but it's, I would say, the natural evolution of the well-proven Hertzian rolling contact fatigue model. Now, if you think about um, the bearing design features and how they influence the bearing performance, the subsurface performance is characterized or influenced by, for example, the internal geometry, like the profiles on the rollers and the raceways. It's strongly influenced by the steel quality, the cleanliness, the microstructure, and of course, in combination with the heat treatment. Also, the hardness and the hardness profile into depth and much, much more. And all this is, is affecting the subsurface fatigue performance. And the surface performance is, of course, also influenced by the internal geometry, by the surface finishing. So if you do honing, if you do grinding, if you do turning, um, coatings have a strong impact. Also, the materials and the material combination, for example, steel hybrid or steel ceramic contact has totally different adhesion properties like a steel steel contact. Of course, also the heat treatment and the hardness and so on is affecting the surface performance and also the, for example, seizure resistance, the tribology in the contact itself, how lubricants interact, how additives interact with the components, and how contaminants damage the surface or how this, how this is healed even by overrolling, which can be the case in hybrid variants. So a lot of design features have different influence on both subsurface and surface. And that's why we developed GBLM quantify this more realistically. We have not developed only one GBLM model, but actually two. A simplified called the load-based model and an advanced called the stress-based model. Um, the load-based model is the one you will find also in SKF.com and which is um, implemented in SKFBearingSelect.com, which you can start using right, right away. And the stress-based model is implemented in SKF Simpro and is used by our application engineers. So if you would like to be interested in calculation of the stress-based model, please get in contact with our SKF application engineering staff, um, service. I mentioned before that we have also introduced another indicator, the RSF, the relative surface fatigue. And this is defined as the ratio between the accumulated fatigue on the surface divided by the accumulated fatigue on surface and subsurface. So you can have values of the RSF between zero and one. And zero would be an indicator. Um, so you have almost no accumulated fatigue on the surface. So that is a predominant subsurface fatigue, which is typically at low or medium load. If you have a good film, if you have no contamination, if you have pure rolling, that's typically, let's say, classical spore. But if the surface fatigue is dominant, the RSF would be close to one. And that is, for example, at high loads, at low film thicknesses, if you have contamination, if you have wear or slip. So the RSF will help you to understand whether you need to choose another size of the bearing, or if you need to work on the lubricant, work on the contamination, like another sealing system. Um, so that will help you to understand your problematic area of volume. Besides this, we have also introduced limits for the rating life models, limits when it comes to speed and load or pressure. Um, also, if you look into the ISO, you will not find any range where the ISO is defined or not defined or valid or not valid. And we say that this is unrealistic. So we introduced another model for all rating life models at SKF, 
which works like this. So on the x-axis, you have the speed factor, the n times dm. And on the y-axis, you have the contact pressure or the load. And then we have the traffic light concept that says if your application conditions are in the green area, the model is valid. If you're in the yellow area, um, it is valid, but you have to take special care for the adequate lubrication. And if you're in the red area, you might run into other failure modes like starvation failure modes, and these are not covered by the model yet. So um, it should prevent the misusage of the model. And please be aware that the load based, and the stress based model have slightly different border lines here because the load based model is based on some simplifications like the size of the loaded zone or no misalignment and so on. So it requires a bit more uh, inherent safety, if you can say it like this. Now you might ask yourself how GBLM has been validated. And for that, we ran tests in the last years on deep groove ball bearings, on angular contact ball bearings, on cylindrical roller bearings of different size at different loading conditions, at different lubricant qualities, and at different contamination levels. And in total, we tested 502 bearings and that had 192 failures. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> now, for each of the test series we performed, you can plot such a characteristic viable chart. In the viable chart, you have on the x-axis the, the life of the bearing in building revolutions or in hours. <clears throat> and on the y-axis, you have the failure probability. And if you then plot all the failures and also the line, um, into, into this chart, you can, for example, read out the L10 life, which would be 10% would be of the bearings failed at a certain life, and that would be the L10 life. But this population of test bearings is always a sample of the whole population of all bearings. So you have to consider some statistics here as well. And that is described by the confidence interval, which is characterized usually by the L10-5 and the L10-95. So if you plot this into the chart, you can, for example, conclude that um, with 90% probability, the real or true life of the entire population will be within these borders, the L10-5 and the L10-95. So the more you test, the closer these borders come to each other, the less you test, the wider they are. If you then plot all the test series we have done at SKF in the last years into one single chart, then you can plot something like this. So on the y-axis, you have the tested life of one test. For example, if it's 100 million revolutions, you would be here. And on the x-axis, you have the calculated life with GBLM. So for example, if you calculate 100 billion revolutions, you would be here. And if these two, if the calculation and the test match exactly, you would be here on, on the bisecting line. That would mean the calculation exactly predicts the test. And if you now plot all the L10-5 and the L10-50, so let's say the left side of our confidence interval, into this chart, you see that the model and the tests correlate very, very well. So the tests slightly last longer than the calculation predicts, but that means that you are on the safe side. So you're slightly conservative, maybe, you're maybe underestimating the real life slightly, but I think it's better to be here in that area than in the risk area and over predicting with the calculation. So a very, very good um, correlation. And you see also that we have very short lives and very long lives. That's an indicator for the, all the different conditions with the different kappas, the different etalcies and load that we tested the 500 bearings. Now let's come to some application examples. Um, we found um, um, test series in the scientific literature, one from Osado Foster and the other one from Chiu. And if you look at the test series from Rosado Foster, you see that this is moderate conditions. 
it's quite high contact stresses. So the hybrid bearings have a contact pressure of 3.5 gigapascal, whereas the all steel bearings have only 3.1. So you see again the stiffness effect of the hybrid bearings. And the ETA is quite high, which is an indicator for good lubrication conditions. Series from GU, we had severe condition. We had lower stress levels, but a much lower ETA. That's an indicator for contamination, for bad lubrication. And if you plot for the Rosado Foster tests, the Bible charts, you see in blue, the one for the test alter all steel bearings and in red for the hybrid bearings. And you see that the steel bearings lasted slightly longer, but not really significantly because the confidence intervals here are overlapping. If you calculate the life of the steel bearings with AFC, you get this vertical line. If you calculate GBLM with GBLM, the hybrid bearings, you get here the red line. And also here you see that the steel bearings lasted slightly longer than the hybrid bearings. As the test showed. But there is not really a benefit for hybrids, maybe even a slight disbenefit. If you go to the other case with the severe conditions, you see that the hybrid bearings outperformed the steel bearings significantly, so there is a clear distance between the confidence intervals, and that's also what the life models predict. So hybrid bearings, the calculation was here between the L50 and the L105, so that's quite a good correlation here. And with AFC, if we calculate the steel bearings, that's giving us a lower life. So here we can really prove and show the hybrid bearing benefit with the calculation as it was proven in the test. Now I would like to get back to my initial example of the pump. Um, so you remember we had 2,400 hours with the ISO-LIFE model. And if we calculate with the load-based GBLM model, that's the one you can use on your own if you want to. You get 18,000 hours. So the GBLM takes definitely the benefit that low kappa and the better resistance to um, indentations and particles into account. Nevertheless, as an engineer, I have to say that technically we should in any case prevent the water and the particles from uh, that application. So um, the hybrid bearing will work better but I think no bearing loves really such conditions long term. The second example is the one of a pump. So that's slightly higher loaded. It's a C over P of eight. The speeds are not extreme. The kappa is quite good with 1.5. So that's a grease lubricated bearing. Um, and the eta C is also quite good with 0.8 due to rubber seals that we have in this application. The ISO model would predict 16,000 hours for that case, and with GBLM, we would get a bit more than 20,000 hours. So you also see here that even at good and clean lubrication conditions, the ISO slightly underestimates the life, and depending on the requirements on the life, there is maybe a potential for reducing the cost. So you could maybe go to another shaft size or go to another bearing series, like a 62 instead of a 63, uh, 63 here with the more realistic calculation. If you want to read more about GBLM, we have numerous publications um, in different magazines, uh, tribological magazines, engineer magazines, and so on, and we may, will make these links available to you. Um, and of course, we are continuously developing GBLM, for example, for special bearing steels for special surface heat treatments, for high speeds, high temperatures, coatings, and much, much more. So stay tuned, check out the SCAP website and communication for further releases of GBN. And now I would like to conclude my presentation with a live demo on a real application example. So for this purpose, I go to skfbearingselect.com. Um, I will log in but it's not really necessary. You can uh, also use it anonymous if you want. So that program, that software is for free. Um, on the initial screen, I choose the calculation of rolling bearings, and I have the choice between calculating a single bearing or two bearings on a shaft. 
And as I would like to do a direct comparison of an all steel bearing with a hybrid bearing, I select two bearings on the shaft. Now for the left, I will choose a 6205 standard deep groove ball bearing. And I, as I have the same size of the shaft on the right side as well, I will take the all the hybrid twin on the right side. So it would be a 6205 HC5 is the indicator for ceramic and it's C3. So that bearing has another uh, clearance class than this bearing on the left, but in the load based model that has no effect. So the only difference now between the left and the right bearing is the left one has steel balls, the right one has ceramic balls. The bearing distance, let's say, is 100 millimeter, and I will not introduce axial loads here. The shaft is horizontal. Now I have to tell the software where I position my load, and you see the z-axis is the one in axial direction. So let's place the load right in the middle at 50 millimeters. And Y would be the radial coordinate. So let's apply a load, let's say three kilonewton at a speed of, um, let's do 5,000 RPM. And I also have to define the temperature of the inner ring and the outer ring. So let's say we have 90 degrees on the outer ring and 80 degrees on the inner ring. That's an estimation. Usually the inner ring has slightly higher temperatures than the outer ring because it's moving and therefore the convection is slightly different. Now I have to hit the calculate button and then I go to the other settings. So you see already here predefined are some operating conditions. Yeah, it pre-selected a suitable grease and anticipates some cleanliness conditions, but in this case I would like to change it. So the LG MT2 is a let's say classical industry degrees commonly used at SKF and um, we have different contamination models and I would like to stick to the most simple one where we have predefined cleanliness level. High cleanliness is an, an ETA C close to one. Very severe contamination would be an ETA C close to zero. So let's start with high cleanliness. I hit OK. Let's just calculate again to, to be so sure. Now you see that the C over P ratio is around 10. The viscosity ratio kappa is around 1.6, which is an indicator for a good, good separating zone. So at these conditions, the bearing rating life for the left, sorry, for the left bearing is 38,000 hours and for the right bearing 27. Hours. So the steel bearing on the left side is outperforming the hybrid bearing on the right side. But I think I expected that because we have no contamination, we have a good separating film. So there is no reason why the hybrid bearing should be better. But now if you would go, for example, to a lower speed. So you don't have enough film buildup now. The kappa dramatically dropped to 0.4. Yeah, so that is an indicator for no separating film. Now you already see that the hybrid bearing overtook the steel bearing by 3000. Sorry, that's the reference speed. <laughs> sorry, 65,000 hours was the hybrid bearing, 12,000 hours was the um, steel bearing. So the hybrid bearing is already outperforming the steel bearing. And also now, if I would go to more realistic contamination conditions like slight typical. Um, contamination. So this is now the ETA C would now drop. You also see here that the hybrid bearing can, yeah, that's around 30% longer life here. So you can try out GBLM on your own with SKF bearing select right after this presentation. If you would like to have uh, calculated the stress based model, please get in contact with SKF. And that's it from my side. Now I'm open for questions. Ilin, do we have any questions in the chat? Yes, <clears throat> but uh, please uh, feel free to uh, write some more questions. I think a fairly, uh, well, 
not uh, maybe not a straightforward one, but uh, is there already a time plan for when the GBLM will be available for full steel models? Um, we have a mid to long term plan to release it for um, all steel bearings as well. We see a lot of benefit, but at the moment we would like to focus for on um, bearings with special design features. So let's say the difference between um, GBLM and the current models is not that much if you stay within a certain frame, I would say. Um, or in other words, if you take a, a catalog bearing to name it like this or a standard bearing and calculate that one with the advanced fatigue calculation, that is predicting the bearing performance very, very well. So there is will be hardly any difference if you stay in a certain speed load range and certain um, contamination conditions that AFC is covering the performance very, very, very well. Uh, GBLM is required if you have special design features that are not in AFC, for example, or if you have extreme application conditions that lead to other failure modes and other damage regions, then GBLM has the benefit and we are continuously developing it and will sooner or later launch it also for all three bands. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, we have another question here um, about polymers. Uh, in cryogenics, uh, where polymers as uh, plastics and uh, where, where polymers are, and plastics are used, uh, as well as ceramic balls, uh, should uh, uh, should there be insulation? And uh, let me see here if I can uh, understand the question here. Maybe um, I think it's related to. Uh, uh, the issue is more related to cracking and not uh, necessarily to fatigue uh, or or damage uh, in when using ceramic balls and plastic cages. I'm um, I'm guessing here. <laughs> okay, maybe, um, maybe maybe I can just <laughs> shed some general words on GBLM. Yeah. Let's say um, GBLM can can quantify numerous failure modes, so we can enhance it, so to say, with other failure modes. Uh, usually we have um, accumulated accu accumulating failure modes. Yeah, so let's say um, an overload. If you have like um, accidentally overloading with a shock load bearing, that is not an accumulating uh, damage. This is a, a simple a single a single location. Or if you have um, a too high speed or too high temperature event that causes maybe um, a cage failure, and uh, that is very hard to fit this into such a life model. But of course, you will all you always need to consider let's say the life calculation and some other models to check whether this model can be applied or not. So you can calculate the nominal life, of course. But if you have known events, shock load events, high temperature events, things like this, you may might need other models to check if this does not kill the bearing before it dies due to the life. So let's say the fatigue life. I hope that answered so, the question. I think it was related to the the sort of the taking the damage or the the failure modes into consideration. But would you say in general that the GBLM model is suitable to use in like perhaps a more ex extreme environments like in cryogenics? Ooh, I would need uh, <laughs> to check that. But in principle, we have ultra, we can um, extend it to alternative lubricants, and we are also yeah. doing this. Doing some research on that. Yes, so uh, definitely, it's 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 uh, maybe a sub model required, but in principle, yes, other lubricants and their behavior can be considered. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a more general question, uh, specifically to the RSF, is that also planned uh, to be uh, for full steel bearings? Yes, at the moment the RSF is not in sfbearingselect.com. Mm -hmm. um, we tested first of all internally. Um, the reason for that is that uh, it's not it's it's a simple value, yep. but um, you need some experience with interpreting it still, and um, it will of course uh, yeah it will help of course the users a lot um, looking at this and we if we release it for all steel bearings we will of course also release the RSF for those bearings. Mm -hmm. Good and, and another um, uh, I think you touched on this, but it's good. I think it's a it's a key uh, part. So does the life calculated by SKF rating life and GBLM differ for non hybrid bearings? Good sort of summary question, perhaps. Um, depends on the application conditions. 
it for let's say for all steel bearings there is uh, depending on application conditions it can be exactly the same but it can also slightly deviate or it can also majorly deviate depending on the models you implement in GVM. Good. All right, let's uh, there is a number of additional questions coming in here. So for yeah, for high temperature, high pressure and high speed applications, which is better to use and last longer? Is it hybrid or steel bearings? Hybrid by far. And the reason for that is the reason for that is that um, so that's, there are numerous advantages. So first of all, um, the um, thermal expansion coefficient of a hybrid bearing is much lower than for an all steel bearing. So you could say that they're um, less changing their dimensions at extreme high temperatures. That is often an advantage, that's one. The second thing is that you have a smaller contact area and at extreme high speeds, um, you might run into starvation effects. So starvation means like uh, think of the, the ball or the roller rolling on the raceway and the lubricant is like pushed away in front of the roller and it needs some, some time to float back after the roller. And if you have very high speeds, you don't have enough time to float back. Now, of course, if you have a wide contact, the lubricant is longer than if you have a narrow or small contact. So that's one reason why hybrid bearings with the smaller contact area have better starvation or let's say run into starvation later mm -hmm. and on top of that um, even if you have uh, not full uh, separating film in hybrid bearings it, it's not as um, dangerous as in steel bearings because you can imagine that the adhesion properties of steel steel is worse than steel against high, uh, ceramic mm -hmm. and that's also so even if you have a low film the hybrid bearing will not suffer that much from starvation effects. And I'm sure there are much, much more effects that I have not mentioned yet, but usually extreme high speeds, extreme high temperatures, extreme high um, loads, that is always a hybrid bearing um, application and also what GVLM um, yeah, can predict realistically. Great. Uh, and a question about Simpro. Uh, so Simpro calculations have load-based life and stress-based life output for HC5. Which one should be uh, which one should be chosen for customer calculation? I would say it depends on the application. Um, I think the the load-based models they usually have some assumptions, like 180 degree loaded zone, like no miss alignment. Um, it's based on the load rating C usually. Uh, for GBLM it's based on other things as well, but you have some simplifications. And I think if you are running the bearing at, let's call it catalog conditions, so nothing extreme. Yeah, You have a decent film, you have um, not significant contamination, you have a realistic load level, then a load-based model is quite good. But if you have an extreme application and also maybe a risky application where bearing failure would be dangerous, mm. I definitely would recommend to go to a stress-based model and then um, get support from SKF for these calculations. Yeah, and talking about perhaps a little bit about more extreme uh, situation, up to which million MDN, M, M, D, M, uh, can we use the GBLM model? Uh, is there a version for high-speed ranges? Um, so the current version, it's uh, difficult. You, you've seen the, the curves, yeah? Of course, how exactly the curves are defined, that's SKF intellectual property, and we put a lot of effort into this to validate uh, these limits experimentally. Um, but as order of magnitude, um, let's say a million NDM and more, mm -hmm. this can be, um, can be, that's in the validity range. And uh, that's also what we are working on right now to see for other bearing designs where the limits are, because we know that some applications operate even at 2.5 million NDM, 3 million NDM, and the bearings work. So it's very difficult to quantify these effects um, in the life model, of course, but it's more even more difficult to run tests at these conditions. Uh, but that's part of our <clears throat> development. Good, and I think uh, this might be our, our final question uh, for today. Um, 
Is there any uh, input for grease properties like oil tap and thickener type in the model? Sorry, I didn't didn't get it. Uh, didn't. Is there any? I mean, is there anywhere where input for for the grease properties like oil type and thickener type? So where we take the the grease uh, properties into consideration in the model? Um, at the moment, uh, the lubricant is defined basically by the viscosity. Um, so the, the thickener is not um, affecting it directly, um, but that's also um, yeah, a research topic we're working on, like the effect of all components of a grease. But um, as current life models, GBLM considers mainly the viscosity. Um, but of course, other models like um, um, Okay, grease life, it's obviously, <laughs> uh, but okay, this, these effects or the thickness and so on are affecting other models, let's say like this. Good, that was our last question. Thank you so much, Albrecht. Um, and I hope uh, to all of you participants that um, you have learned something new about GBLM and how you can use it. Um, I will add uh, the, the link, I've already added the link to uh, SKF Bearing Select here in the chat so you can use it. Um, I will also add the link to where you can find the recording of this webinar. Um, you can also find it on the SKF YouTube channel, but you can also find it consolidated on the SKF Evolution magazine. Um, but um, yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Albert. Uh, and I wish you all a really nice rest of your day. Thank you and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year afterwards. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.